Welcome back to the online edition of the Auditorium Bible Class at Open Door Baptist Church in Harrison, Arkansas, where Howard Bramer is the lead pastor. I am Daryl DeShields, and I've been teaching this class for several weeks online due to the COVID-19 crisis. We begin by introducing a series of studies on valleys in Christian living, and up till today, this is what we've been studying. First, we said, why study the valleys of life? Second, how God uses the valleys of life. Third, the valley of discouragement. Fourth, the valley of sickness. Fifth was the valley of chastisement. In the last two weeks, we've been studying the valley of the shadow of death. Today, we're going to begin a series on valley of conflict, the valley of conflict. We see in our text, it's going to be found in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 11. Let me read it for you. It says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekah, and the Pesodermon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants." But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And of course, this is the setup to the scene where David is going to go out into battle against Goliath. But the see, thing that we see here is that there was going to be a conflict. The valley is going to be a place of conflict. Before we get to our lesson on the valley of conflict, I want to spend some time discussing, first of all, how the devil attacks the word of God, and secondly, the denial of infallible inspiration, which leads to this conflict that Christians are experiencing today. So let's begin with how the devil attacks the Word of God. You see, the devil, Satan, is ruthless, living for the sole purpose of defying God and stealing his glory. He longs to make the pinnacle of God's creation, which is mankind, remain alienated from God. He doesn't want us to get close to God. He wants to stay separated from him. He wants to still be our ruler and leader. Also, he desires to take God's children, those who have turned from sin and to righteousness by the blood of Christ and make them doubt or give in to the flesh. So it's okay for them to be a child of God, but he doesn't want them to live for God. He wants them to live for him instead. Then also we can say that he is a praying lion seeking to devour and destroy. Now Satan has a variety of methods to employ to this end. But the constant in his strategy will be to attack the Word of God. He must do this because the Word of God is sharp and powerful and able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. That we find in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. There it says, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let's just think about this verse for just a, a little time. It begins with, for the word of God. In other words, the truth of God is all penetrating and searching 
and the real thoughts and intents of the heart will be brought to light. If there's any insincerity and self-deception, there can be no hope of escape. God's word will reveal it. Then it says it's quick. In other words, it's living, has a living power and is energetic and active. The vital energy of God's word penetrates what is most deeply hidden in our nature, bringing to light our most secret inclinations and purposes. We cannot hide from God. We are open a book before him. Then it says, and powerful. In other words, mighty. Its power is seen in the awakening, awakening the conscience, laying bare the secret feelings of the heart, and causing the sinner to tremble with the apprehension of coming judgment. Now think about this. All the great changes in the moral world for the better have been caused by the power of truth. Let me repeat that. All the great changes in the moral world for the better have been caused by the power of truth. Across the world, over, the, over history, we've seen time and again a revival is broken out because of the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God, and life has changed. Culture has changed because of it. The verse goes on to say, sharper than any two-edged sword. The comparison to a sword is designed to show its power penetrating the heart. The meaning is that the Word of God reaches the heart, the very center of action, and lays open the motives and feelings of the man. Then it goes on piercing even to the dividing center. In other words, penetrating to divide. And it's a discerner of the thoughts. The thoughts and intents of the heart are brought to view by the Word of God. So let's go back and once again say, the Word of God is a sword. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, we read, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. You know, when you go into battle, you need a weapon. If you're going to go into battle, you have to have a weapon in order to be successful. In the Christian life, the word of God is our offensive weapon. It is our sword. And we are called to put on the whole armor of God for our protection, but also to take up the sword of God as our weapon. We could also say that the word of God is a mirror. It's a mirror. In James chapter 1, verse 23, we read, For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. Every morning when we get up, we go into to the restroom, and we spend time in front of the mirror. And what do we see? We see the real us, don't we? We see what we look like after a night in bed. As a sword and spirit, the word of God reveals truth and exposes darkness something Satan cannot afford to happen. Now remember, Satan is a father of lies, and the Word of God exposes his lies. Satan must go after the Word of God, and it must be central to his diabolical deceiving strategies. What is certain is that Satan is fully aware of the Scripture, and he knows it inside and out. He has no doubt that God's Word is infallible and true, Unlike the people, he enjoys keeping from the truth. Thus, even from the very first time the serpent is seen in Scripture in Genesis chapter 3, he is attacking the spoken and revealed words of God to Adam and Eve. So we can say that Satan always challenges God's word. He does not want people to have access to it, to read it, or to understand it. But when they are confronted with it, he will always challenge it. Now think about this. We are blessed that God's word endures forever. We are blessed that God's word endures forever. First Peter chapter 1 verse 25 says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You know, we are blessed that God has reserved his word for us to study and to learn. This body of truth must be held to. It must be guarded, defended, and preached. Doubt is a toxin of the devil, and disbelief in God's revealed word is the real opiate of the masses. So we've been talking about how the devil attacks the word of God. Now I want to take some time to think about denial of infallible inspiration. Denial of infallible inspiration. First of all, we'd say that the Bible reflects the viewpoints of the writers. The Bible reflects the viewpoints of the, of the writers. 
The most common argument that undermines the Bible goes something like this. Although scripture is infallibly inspired by God, it nevertheless reflects the notions and viewpoints of the men whom God used to write it. Men whose thinking was influenced by a bygone culture and betrays a lack of scientific knowledge. We hear that garbage time and time again today. Some people say this view is The Bible is the word of God. They insist that Genesis 1 is not a literal account of creation. Now before I go on, let me make this statement. I believe that the Bible is infallible. I believe that it's the word of God that has been preserved by God down through history. It is to be interpreted, scripture interprets scripture. It is not man's theory, it's not man's thoughts, it's what God has penned and placed here for us in order to know him and to live for him. So let me come back and it says that they, they do not believe that Genesis 1 is a real account. They think maybe it's a saga, some kind of a story. Or they may call it a myth. But then others say it's a doxology intended by the church to praise God the creator. But whatever it is, they claim Genesis 1 is not to be taken literally. Now think about that for a moment. When you can make the statement that a portion of God's word is not to be taken literally, then you're taking on the prospect of being God to determine what is scripture and what is not scripture. I take the word of God literally for what it has to say. The next thing that we had talked about is women elders and preachers. I know this is a controversial subject today, but it needs to be touched upon. You see, a similar argument is employed by those who advocate women elders and preachers. They concede that certain passages in the Bible do forbid women from holding an ecclesiastical office. But those injunctions, they say, apply to the culture and customs prevailing at the time when the Bible was written are no longer relevant in the modern world. Now, let me say this. I'm 73 and a half years old, and during my life, I have seen culture change dramatically, time and time again. In fact, in the year 2020, culture has changed dramatically. Culture changes, but God's word does not change. Then we can talk about homosexuality. That's a big key word in society today. Let me read to you portions of a book that was written by Janet Edmonds. And she titled it, The Bible Doesn't Say That Homosexuality Is a Sin. She says, the Bible doesn't say that homosexuality is a sin. This is what she has to say. Some Christians believe the Bible tells us that homosexuals are sinners. The current trend of increased acceptance of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer, or LGBTQ, community is distressing to those Christians who sincerely want to follow the Bible. Yes, that's true. They feel it's wrong to encourage homosexuals in any way because it would mean going against God's word. This is one of the main reasons some people have so much trouble accepting homosexuals. They are using the words that appear in the scriptures in the Bible at face value to condemn homosexuals. homosexuals. Does the Bible actually condemn caring, consensual, homosexual relationships? What was written, what was the original intent of those laws, lessons and guidelines written in the Bible so long ago? A little bit later she says, when the Bible was written, the Hebrew culture basically ignored the concept of a loving, committed, adult, homosexual relationship. And my thought is this, the Bible does talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, doesn't it? It speaks very plainly how that God brought judgment of those cities because of homosexuality. And the Bible in Romans chapter 1 very speaks very plainly against homosexuality. Coming back to our text, this woman once again says this, Jesus teaches us that loving each other is far more important than strictly following Jewish laws. He said that the first commandment is to love God. And the second commandment is love others as you love yourself. 
Well, they've changed the Word of God, have they not? They do not accept the Word of God as being the inspired Word of God. So there are those who agree that some passages in the Bible can be interpreted as condemning homosexuality, but that changing social environments require the church to deal with such passages on homosexuality as we have dealt with passages on slavery, usury, war, or even the role of women. Now let me share, I, think, I believe there's an underlying error here. You see, behind these positions is the common theme, the Bible, though inspired, contains a human element or factor because it was penned by men that were specifically chosen by God. Yes, that's true. God chose them. He chose those men because they lived at a particular time in history, had particular gifts and particular character traits, and held views that were formed in the culture in which they lived. And God allowed those personalities, those unique gifts, and their culture influences to be incorporated into the scripture. God did not allow that. So look, one more thought is human theologies. The insistence that there is a human element in scripture leads to yet another error. Increasingly, theologians speak of the, of the theology of Paul, the theology of John, the, the eschatology of Peter, and so forth. And this is wrong. You see, the very term theology of Paul suggests that Paul's view of truth was his own invention. The fact is this. Because scripture is of divine origin, it contains only God's theology. And the believer accepting the scripture as such is interested only in what God says in truth. You see, it's not matter what man thinks, it is what God says. Yet scholars preoccupied with the idea of human element in scripture are intent on explaining how the scripture came into being from the human point of view. And to understand this human element, they say a great deal of additional knowledge is required. We are told, for example, that to understand what the Bible teaches, one must be well informed in archaeology because we can know the ancient cult cultures in which the Old Testament is written from bones and pieces of pottery. One must also study old Jewish, Greek, and Roman writings to learn the kind of thinking that prevailed when the New Testament Gospels were written. One ought to be thoroughly acquainted with the Greek language as it was used 2,000 years ago to know what any given New Testament verse really means. So let me say that's not necessary. Not necessary. I am not saying that the study of these things cannot be an aid to Bible studies, but they are not essential to understanding Scripture. You see, the Bible is its own dictionary and commentary, for Scripture interprets Scripture. God speaks in Scripture. He speaks to those who came to Scripture in faith. It does not require the wisdom of the world to understand. So we come to this. The Valley of Conflict is possibly the longest of all valleys. This is because it's an ongoing battle, a battle between right and wrong, a battle between good and evil, a, a valley between con conserv conservatism and liberalism, and between godliness and God, ungodliness. It is an ongoing battle. You see, ladies and gentlemen, everything that a church or a child of God believes in is under attack. Nobody likes to fight, but salvation is under attack. Where works are added and repentance is removed. Where e when either occurs, salvation, true salvation is lost. The word of God is under attack. The Bible, they say, is supposedly filled with errors. The Bible contains the Word of God rather than is the Word of God, is what they say. Also, doctors of the faith are under attack. You see, work salvation rather than grace salvation is being promoted. Atonement is only for the elect instead of available for all. Giving is based only on what you can afford to give instead of the tithe plus free will offerings. You see, God's people are in a never-ending fight against a formidable foe who battles with a vengeance. Under Satan's leadership, everything that is right is under attack. Thus, we can truthfully say that God's people are in a war, like it or not, and the command to fight by the captain of the Lord's host. Jude chapter 1, verse 3 tells us this. 
Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So in today's lesson, we have taken time to consider how the devil attacks the word of God and the denial of infallible inspiration as our first part in the consideration of the valley of conflict. Next time, we will consider the enemy and the engagement, and we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.